thank you for the very nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, this afternoon to tell you about some of the new exciting advances in genomics and the interplay between the digital world and the biological world. Now, when we read the sequence of DNA, we convert the ACs, Gs, and Ts of the analog DNA molecule into the ones and zeros in the computer. So you can actually see this with uh, the early genomes uh, that we did. In 1995, the first genome of a living cell. And then five years later, as you heard, the first a draft of the human genome. Uh, we went on a few years uh, later to do the first complete human genome, showing that all humans are about uh, one to three percent uh, different from each other. All this information gets digitized in the computer. The challenge is can we now go the other way and understand the basis of life? For example, how many genes are essential for life? Uh, what's the smallest number of genes to get a living cell? And then ultimately, could we design and construct the genome of a cell for the first time in history? As soon as we asked these questions, there were new questions. Would chemistry even allow us to build a large piece of DNA like a chromosome? And if we could, could we even boot it up? Or would it just be a large inert molecule? So we started in 2003 with trying to make a synthetic phage, a virus that kills bacteria. We started with the genetic code in the computer, four bottles of chemicals, and we wrote the 5,000 letter uh, genome out in a chemical sequence. The exciting phase came next when we inserted that into E. coli. The bacteria recognized the synthetic DNA as normal DNA. It started reading it, and it started making proteins. The protein self-assembled uh, to form the virus particle, which kills the cells, which is how we see it uh, on these plaques. So we call this a situation where the software is building its own hardware. DNA is the software. In this case, the phage or the virus is the hardware. But we wanted to make a living cell, uh, not a small virus. We found that we could actually put together in a constant uh, process that took several years, the pieces of DNA to make larger and larger pieces. Uh, this finally allowed us to make uh, the first synthetic chromosome in 2008. This was the largest chemical of a defined structure uh, ever made by humans. We continued to improve the chemistry. Uh, Dan Gibson uh, at the Venter Institute and now at Synthetic Genomics developed a whole new method uh, we're just in one single test tube. We just add fragments of DNA, and they get automatically assembled into larger pieces. This means we can have a robot uh, to make uh, the large pieces of DNA. We don't need humans uh, to do this in the laboratory. So we continue to make uh, large pieces, but the other challenge was trying to boot up that new software. So this study in 2007 is perhaps one of the most important that changed my view of life and how life works, and maybe it will change yours. In this study, we simply replace the software in one cell with the DNA from another cell, and in a short period of time, completely converted one species into another. So let me walk you through this because it's a very important step. So we took the chromosome out of one cell, uh, and we put that in another cell. And these species are about the same distance that humans are from mice, about 10% different. So let me show you what we think happened. So we added the new chromosome uh, to the cell. So now we have the body of one species, and there's two sets of genetic instructions, two sets of software. So what happened in a very short period of time, uh, that software started to get read. It made enzymes. Some of the enzymes recognized the chromosome already in the cell as foreign DNA and chewed it up. So now we have the body of one species and the DNA software of another species. So what happened in a very short time, 
we had these new bright blue cells, and when we interrogated them, uh, we found only the DNA from the, uh, that we inserted into the cell, and every molecule in the cell, every protein in the cell, was derived from instructions from that new DNA code. So it's very simple now. Life is a DNA software system. If you change the DNA software, you change the species. Now, we wanted to make an entire living self-replicating cell, so we synthesized the 1.1 million letter genetic code uh, of M. mycoides. So this was a complicated process. We started with pieces that were 1,000 letters long, and we put 10 of those together to make pieces that were 10,000 letters long. And then we put 10 of those together to make pieces that were 100,000 letters long. And then we put 11 of those together to make the complete chromosome. The next thing that happened, we inserted these into a cell. Hopefully the next thing that happens. And we got the, uh, uh, the first synthetic organisms. So these, or these cells can self-replicate. They've divided billions of times to make more copies of themselves. And this is the first life form on this planet that had a computer as its parent. Thank you. Now, how did we know it was just the synthetic DNA? Well, we learned to actually write in the genetic code uh, things in the form of DNA letters. So we can write the entire English language or Spanish with numbers and punctuation in DNA. So we wrote this new code in the, uh, in the genome of this cell, including a URL being the first species to have a computer as a parent. We thought it was important that it should have its own web address. And so as people solved the genetic code, uh, they were able uh, to send an email saying they solved uh, this puzzle. So in these watermarks are the names of the 46 scientists that contributed to this work uh, over the several year process. And also three quotations from the literature. Uh, I think you can see those here. Uh, the first from James Joyce, uh, to live, to err, to fall, to triumph, to recreate life out of life. The second from Oppenheimer's biography, American Prometheus, see things not as they are, but as they might be. Uh, and the third uh, from Richard Feynman, what I cannot build, I cannot understand. So all this uh, written into the genome, so there's no chance uh, this was a natural uh, chromosome. Now the interesting thing is, uh, we started getting uh, letters after this was uh, uh, published and we got a letter from James Joyce's attorney uh, saying you didn't have permission uh, to use the quotation in DNA. Uh, it turns out the rules do allow you to use single quotations with attributions. But then we started getting emails from a Caltech scientist saying we had misquoted Richard Feynman. And they sent this picture of Feynman's blackboard at Caltech uh, showing what the correct quotation was, which I think is a much better one. What I cannot create I do not understand. So we've gone back to change the genetic code so it's the correct quotation uh, written into DNA. So where is this going? We now have computer software to design new life software. And we're trying to design new cells to do a number of things, including capture energy from the sunlight, capture carbon dioxide to make new foods, fuels, and chemicals. Uh, we've had some success with this. Uh, it's hard to see here, but uh, we've actually changed photosynthesis for the first time and increased its efficiency by threefold. That means for the same amount of sunlight and the same amount of photons, we get far more energy uh, produced in the cell. Also now, we can clearly go this other direction. We can start with these ones and zeros in the digital world and we can go back to make DNA software. So if you can go back and forth in the computer, all of a sudden we can do something different, treating life as digital information. 
we can actually send that digital information as an electromagnetic wave at the speed of light. So we're building sending units and we're building receiving units. So we call our receiving unit a digital to biological converter. So this can take the electromagnetic wave, convert it back into DNA, and all life on this planet that we know of is all DNA based. So once you can remake DNA, you can remake the software of life. In theory, you can remake uh, any life. So the implications of this, some of them are simple uh, and some are much more complex. But one of the problems with finding out if there's life on Mars is getting samples back from Mars uh, to uh, interrogate for life. Instead, we can just put a sending unit there that takes DNA in a sending unit and sends it back as an electromagnetic wave. When Mars and Earth are at their closest, this takes only 4.3 minutes instead of months uh, by a rocket uh, with almost no expense because you don't have to get a, a rocket to Mars and send it back. It is also a lot safer because, of, in fact, if there are Martian microbes, we can recreate them in a very safe uh, P4 lab uh, in case they're infectious. So this is much better than having a, a capsule splash down uh, into the ocean. Also, it changes the way we will be able to deal with pandemics in the future. Uh, we've been working on influenza virus, and people are very aware of H1N1 uh, that had a big effect starting in Mexico City a few years ago. Uh, in fact, it didn't materialize into the pandemic that people were afraid, like the one in 1918 that killed 3% of the world's population. 3% today would be about uh, 210 uh, million people. But the plan is, because we can change how we make vaccines, instead of using 900 million eggs to make flu vaccine, uh, this should now be done uh, in mammalian cells. Uh, my institute and others are tracking by DNA sequencing uh, the evolution of the flu virus around the world. So we know what's changing, we know what to do in advance. So we've totally changed the speed for making new vaccines. In fact, we're collaborating with Novartis uh, and with the agency BARDA in the U.S. government. And now we have it down to a very short period. The government sends us a test pandemic sequence and in less than 24 hours, we make the new vaccine. It's still a complicated process, and Novartis has a multi-billion dollar facility built uh, in North Carolina with the help of the U.S. government. Uh, but if we can send things there digitally, we don't have to move things around in the case of a pandemic. And just think if there were smaller versions of these facilities everywhere, uh, one in the city, perhaps one uh, even in your local uh, university, because this will be the future. You will have a box attached to your computer that will be the future of downloading biology from the internet and recreating it, perhaps even in your home. You may be able to download a vaccine or a drug like insulin straight from your internet. So this is an exciting phase and a change in how the world is changing. People know about the 3D printers now where you can just download digital information and make devices uh, converting digital information into solid objects. By combining all these, different groups now are using 3D printers to print human tissues. So here's some human skin that was printed just with a 3D printer. Now it's different printing out cells in a matrix like this than what we're doing of creating new life from scratch with the genetic code. But just think as these things get combined, how exciting the, the future will be. We can send life at the speed of light. We can recreate it. This solves problems like uh, sample return from distant planets, and we have over a hundred million Earths and super-Earths just in our own galaxy. We'll be able to download vaccines and medicines uh, right from the internet, hopefully being able to prevent a few future pandemics. So what's the future going to be as we combine 
solid printing, with printing biology, with creating new biology, all from digital information. I think it's open to our imaginations and an exciting future. Thank you very much.